Hey, this is Nick Cellini from 680 The Fan in Atlanta. You're listening to Middle Georgia's number one show for community and collegiate sports from Atlanta to Savannah. And they didn't even pay me to say this. It's the Rob, Ben and Joe Show. All right, welcome in, everybody, to another podcast. It's the Rob, Ben, and Joe Show. Joe Powers here, Rob and Ben East over there, and one of our, uh, dare shall we say, uh, guys, one of our best friends, Mr. Wes Durham here on the show with us today. Wes, how you doing? I'm great, guys. Thanks for having me back. Yes, sir. It's great to be here. I know you're a busy man, so we take a, a great pleasure in having you here. Uh, we want to say thanks to our sponsor, Oconee EMC, for bringing us this show each and every week. And uh, Rob and Ben East, we've got the man here. I think we can bombard him with some uh, ACC or maybe some NIL conversation. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we can. I, I think he may want us to stay away some of the NIL because we may be here for uh, three years and six months and some <laughs> other change trying to debate it like everybody else is. But uh, Wes, uh, just kind of start off here uh being in the acc as much as you uh, as much as you are uh how do you think uh last year the acc kind of had a, a really down year kind of you know pittsburgh had a good year but it was i would dare say you know kind of an odd year con- considered some of the conference was down and some of the coaching changes and then clemson wasn't as good because quarterback play and various other reasons they had a lot of people leave but this year for the acc and football in particular how do you think some of them did in the transfer por- portal uh recruiting and what do you think think is going to look like uh, shaping up for the fall for football for the ACC? Well, it's going to be interesting because I think the league has got a lot of value, especially at quarterback. I, I think that a year ago, as you mentioned, Clemson wasn't particularly strong in that area, but it seemingly was a was a point of, uh, of success for a lot of teams in the ACC. I think when you talk about where the league is this year, I think quarterback play is really going to be interesting. I think it's got a chance again to be the best quarterback league in the country. Uh, that's an uncomfortable statement for some, but it's not incredibly uncomfortable when you talk to ACC coaches. Uh, we just finished doing three shows last week at the spring meetings down in Florida, and we talked to a lot of football coaches and a lot agree that it's going to be a great league, and even some unknowns. I mean, I think at North Carolina, it could be Drake May, it could be Jacoby Criswell. Um, at Clemson, obviously, Uwe Ungalale did not have the great year everybody thought he would, but now Cade Kludnick's come in from Texas, and they expect uh, a challenge there. Then you've got known commodities. Uh, Malik Cunningham at Louisville. Uh, you've got um, Brennan Armstrong back at Virginia. you got Phil Jerkovic at Boston College. Keaton Slovis, I think, will win the Pittsburgh job, the transfer from Southern California. Then you get to the guys who I think are special talents. I think Tyler Van Dyke could easily be in the Heisman conversation out of Miami. Um, I think Sam Hartman at Wake Forest, I think he's played about 10 years at Wake Forest. Uh, so <laughs> yes. you know, it's probably about time for him to be in some postseason conversation. Do- Dr. As well. Hartman. Yeah, no question. <laughs> uh, and then I think you've got um, you've got a kid in Devin Leary at NC State. And I think Devin Leary is the one that's flying under the radar, to be honest because he got hurt two years ago. And last year, you know, NC State was just kind of an also ran in the deal because people were focused on Kenny Pickett. And Devin Leary had a special year. And I think there's a lot to like about Leary. I think the quarterback situation at, uh, at Virginia Tech probably falls to Brown, the Marshall transfer. Um, and then you've got a couple of other situations. You know, Georgia Tech has Jeff Sims coming back, who now will start for a third straight year. If he can stay healthy and they can establish some sort of offensive line and run game, you know, Sims probably can do some things. But I, I think the, the league itself is going to be pretty good. And, you know, they're going to be – it's going to be a fist fight in the Atlantic. I think Clemson's obviously going to be the favorite. But I think you have to look hard at Wake Forest, who brings 18 starters back and a team that's been well-coached and well-schemed. Um, I think Boston College is going to be in the mix. I think Louisville is going to be in the mix somehow. Um, NC State, to me, is probably shockingly going to be ranked somewhere in the top 15 in the preseason. A lot, And I say shockingly because I think a lot of people nationally don't think of NC State that way. Yeah. Um, but they bring almost 20 starters back. Wow. So, I mean, it's going to be a league, I think, that is going to have uh, certainly a candidate for the college football playoff. But the important thing I think the ACC learned last year is despite what happens nationally, Uh, you're not dead in the water after week one. Mm. And when Clemson lost to Georgia, uh, a lot of people were writing the Atlantic Coast Conference off and killing the Clemson dynasty. 
Well, Clemson held on to win 10 games for the 11th straight year. And that's still a pretty good streak. So I, I think the league has got some really good, interesting coaching hires. Uh, I'm particularly interested to see Tony Elliott at Virginia. Um, really, Mario Cristobal comes in with a ton of hype and a ton of progress and an incredible staff. I think Miami is going to be a factor in this thing, too. And it's going to be interesting to watch that unfold because they go to Texas, uh, Texas A&M in week two of the season. Yeah, that's going to be really interesting. And uh, you know, the Coastal Division um, last year kind of dragged behind the Atlantic, and that's kind of where it started to stack a little bit. You've had some guys mm-hmm. in the Coastal do something, but kind of Miami's been here or there with the coaching changes in Georgia Tech. And North Carolina was kind of a miss last year. We thought they were going to have a good year, and they kind of leveled off. Duke was so-so. So I think the Coastal has to try to answer back, and especially with some of those newer uh, newer hires um, some and these guys that you're talking about coming back, I think that makes a huge difference. But um, I think one thing the ACC is going to have to answer on is uh, on the defensive side of the ball. Outside of Clemson, some of the defenses have dragged a little bit. Um, do you think you'll see an uptick in the in the defensive quality in the ACC this year? Um, well, I think, I think Clemson is going to be obviously terrific on defense if they stay healthy. And then I think NC State's going to be a close second. Um, NC State got everybody who could have foregone the COVID year or the extra year or whatever you want to call it. Most of those guys came back. And I, I think that that is going to be great. And the other thing, too, that and part of the reason I like NC State is because of the coaching continuity that Dave Doran now has. I mean, his yeah. coordinators are back for a third straight year uh, in Tim Beck and Tony Gibson. Um and I think that makes a big difference. And they've got some players in the secondary. They've recruited very well. Um, but defensively, I think the real question marks defensively are probably going to be at Virginia, um, where they've obviously got an uphill climb. They, they weren't very good on defense last year. Uh, I think the, the situation at Duke is going to be interesting just simply because they're all new. I mean, almost every coach on that staff was was replaced. Yeah, that's uh, tough. That David Cutcliffe had. Um, I would say that Louisville, because of what they've done, and Brian Brown being there for three or four years as a coordinator, I think that gives Louisville a chance to have some success. They've got Yasir Abdullah, who I think is going to be a pro. He's a terrific player, kind of a hybrid linebacker, strong safety. The, the thing for me is can schools like Boston College answer the bell because you know they're probably going to be pretty good and people don't want to hear that. But Pittsburgh will also be really good. Kalaja Kansi is probably going to be an All-American in a first day or second day NFL pick next year. I think he's terrific. And Pat Narduzzi hangs his hat on defense. That's the other thing, too. I, I joked with Narduzzi about three-quarters of the way through the season. I said, everybody's talking about you being on offense and, and what <laughs> or not you are on offense, and they're forgetting how good you are on defense. I know. And so with the number of guys they bring back, I I honestly believe that, you know, Clemson, NC State, Pittsburgh are probably the three best defensive units. And then Miami, again, I'll I'll go back to Cristobal here, guys. The thing about Miami is going to be that everybody's going to look at them. And when they run on the field, you're going to see a lot of defensive returnees. And all that means is that Van Dyke, who I think brings back a terrific offensive line and tremendous skill guys on the perimeter – but they want one more guy on the perimeter. They need a game changer to catch the football from Van Dyke. Uh, you know, kind of like they had Mike Harley last year, who when healthy was really good for them. And they bring Mallory back at tight end. But I think Miami's going to be a handful, uh, especially from about midseason on, just because of what Cristobal is, is going to do. And it's going to make things in the coastal pretty interesting, I think. Yeah, I, I think the I think all around it's going to be a, an interesting year. You got some teams like you alluded to, Boston College, and in particular, you know, Georgia Tech really needs to take a step and at least go 500, or they're probably going to be looking at a coaching Georgia change from the top. Have, Georgia Tech's going to have a heck of a time going 500. <laughs> have you they seen the their schedule? Dolphins and the 85 Bears all the time. I, I, that's, I mean, that's that's what the schedule's are, rough. We talked schedule about it. I mean, playing, I mean. Think about it. Opening night, Labor Day night, and Clemson. Fans, they're going to get Clemson. Then they're going to play Western Carolina. Well, you could take the five of us, four of us, and get Western Carolina. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we're not in very good shape. That's right. uh, and then they're going to play UCF and Ole Miss. I mean, that's their first four games. <sighs> so, I, I mean, I like Jeff. I like Brent Key. I like their staff. I mean, I know they've had a ton of changeovers from an assistant situation. 
But I it's mean, tough. I'm not going to tell you anything I haven't told them. They got to calm the schedule down. They yeah. Call, I mean, they're lining up. They're playing as good a schedule in, in some respects as anybody in this league. And they're not playing. I mean, and then, oh, by the way, they're going to play Georgia at the end. Yeah. So yeah. at I mean, Florida State this year. I mean, well, oh, I mean, and again, Florida State, there again, there's another school that's decided they're going to go with Jordan Travis, who's electric at quarterback, and Mike Norvell's got his system built. So I guess what I'm getting at is, is Georgia Tech in 500 <laughs> right now is, I mean, 500 would be a heck of a year. Yeah. Because. It's going to be incredibly difficult for them, I think, to build momentum after what kind of start they're going to face. Yeah, it's going to be really, really tough. We've already we've talked about that, and it's just they don't really get any breaks. They've had a really tough last three years and don't get any let up even with a new OC. But um, with the new uh, – with kind of some of the rumblings, uh, I wanted to ask you uh, in the ACC about, t- about the idea of doing away with the Atlantic and the Coastal Division and doing some sort of a mix-up where you have rotating uh, opponents you don't really have the same you may have three permanents uh every year and then the rest is kind of uh you kind of fill in and play different people what's what's your thoughts on that is there any truth to that inside the acc oh, yeah. uh, what, what, what what do you think that would help the conference be a little bit better or worse no i think it helps the conference tremendously um i think that the what they're talking about doing is uh, it's called the three five five model you would play three teams on a permanent basis every year in the conference. And then the other five, you would rotate uh, each year. In other words, you'd play the remaining 10 teams. You'd play five the first year and five the second year, but the other three would still be rolled in there. And you've got to do the math to create a four and four situation home and away. And in all honesty, for the ACC, it gives them a lot better value uh, for not only fans, it gives them a better television value in terms of their revenue possibilities. Uh, and then the third thing, believe it or not, is when you go to divisions and you play it the way they do, um, you end up with situations where, quite frankly, schools don't see each other on a very regular basis. Yeah. I mean, like Georgia Tech plays Clemson every year. Or they play Miami every year. Um, but in all honesty, Georgia Tech has only seen – you know, they've seen Louisville twice since Louisville entered the league nine years ago. Hmm. The better example is Dave Clawson has been the head football coach at Wake Forest. He's never played Miami. Now, they were supposed to play the year of the pandemic, and it didn't happen. But Wake Forest and Miami have not played in nearly a decade. That's Duke ridiculous. And NC State, Duke and NC State, guys, is the most pronounced one. They're 20 miles away, and they don't play but once every six years. Yeah, That's a problem. That's that a is. problem. If, if you go this model, it allows a four-year college football player to play in every stadium in the conference. Yeah. As long as you got 14 members and you're playing eight games. So I think that's the part that they've got to work out. I still think they've got to do some working out of the details. The other thing I would caution fans about who follow the ACC, don't get caught up in your three permanent opponents based on geography. A lot of this is going to have to do with television possibilities, and they're going to let the TV partners have a say-so in this, and they should because the TV partners pay them a certain amount of money, and with the right ratings and the right revenues, they pay them more. So I think it's a smart play by the Atlantic Coast Conference, and you know, quite frankly, in one way, it's it's about five or six years overdue because I I think you could have had – I think you could have had two teams – potentially college football playoff type teams. You had it with Notre Dame and Clemson a couple of years ago during the pandemic. And I think that was the convincing season for everybody that might be on the fence. And don't get me wrong. There's still some that want to stay in divisions and things of that nature. But in the, in the case of the ACC right now, I think it's the proper thing to do. And it sets you up in your championship game, particularly in football to where you don't have one of those uh, Georgia tech, Florida States from, 10 years ago when Florida State's got Jameis Winston competing to go to a national championship and Georgia Tech 6-6 six and because six they backdoored it against Virginia. When you have the conferences like that, you're going to take the best two teams. And the ACC has a chance to trailblaze, in my, my personal opinion, in this because the SEC keeps growing. These other conferences are doing different things. So I think it could really benefit the ACC by taking the lead on something like that. And then it really makes the teams rise to the top. Like you say, you're not going – you know, as far as television audience goes, Georgia Tech or take, for instance, North Carolina, they're playing Duke, Miami, Pitt. Well, they're missing out if some of those teams in the Atlantic have great historic programs. They're doing really well. 
and the other teams have dragged behind, it'll really kind of level it out like you're talking about with revenue, and it will really give the conference better exposure, I think, from a, from a, really from the entire standpoint of the conference. Well, you've got a conference that has more top 50 media markets in it than any other league in the country. Mm-hmm. And you need to find a way to take advantage of those media markets. Now, we all watch these games a lot different than we used to 25 years ago. Um, and that's a, that's a big deal, too, because we don't yet quite have our hands on the numbers of people that stream. Um, and that's very popular now, especially among people 18 to 35. And so the measurements and the analytics on that, you got to create the matchups as much as you possibly can. And, you know, look, your point about the championship game, it's, it's well made because, you know, the Atlantic division has kind of dominated that side. And there have been years where, you know, a couple of years ago, Clemson was playing a, a Virginia team that was seven and five. Yeah. And it was it, nothing wrong with Virginia, but a seven and five Virginia playing a 12 and 0 Clemson Hurts not going Clemson. to move the needle Mm-mm. to the college football playoff. And so we got to make sure we take care of some of that because anytime you slip, uh, it's, it's going to create a problem. And the league is already playing shorthanded from a national perspective because of the inconsistencies that it's shown. And they're trying now to, to kind of put a foot in the ground and see if they can hold that spot in the road and even may, maybe take another step or two along the way. Yeah, and, uh, and I, I kind of want to I want to touch on this briefly. Like we said, I don't want to get too far in this rabbit hole because we could talk forever about it. But does the NIL – in in your opinion, does it does it help the ACC and some of the schools that may be less revenue generating um, on a football perspective compared to some of the SEC schools if they're in bigger markets? Does the NIL help some of these schools that don't have as much booster and alumni money that's coming in and they may not be in the best televised games and they may have some weak things? Does it help them at all compete with the Georgias and the Alabamas or even make it close? I know it's a really hard comparison comparison but does the nil help at all some of these schools i don't know that nil has all it's done is muddy the water i mean look we all see the kids that move from one school to the next and we hear reports about the compensation levels but we haven't seen one of these student athletes file a tax document yet to prove just how much they've made (laughs) that's true okay i mean so when they pay taxes and oh, by the way, they have to pay taxes on that money. Yes. And if they don't pay taxes on that money, it's going to be really interesting (laughs) because (laughs) uncle Sam will want a piece of that money. And there are a lot of people, you know, I mean, I'm not speaking to any school in particular. There are a lot of kids who are allegedly getting name, image and likeness money that if they don't understand the tax implications of it, and that is something that is having to be discussed with some of these kids, unfortunately, um, you know, that, that creates issue. I, I don't think the NIL has, you know, it, it, to say it's benefited somebody or hurt somebody because they don't pay NIL, I, I'm not sure. We're less than a year into it. Um, the thing that's out of control is the transfer portal. Oh, right? yeah, it's awful. There's the no requirement. Portal. There's no rules. I mean, you can just well, do whatever you want. There's no rules to. to NIL either. Yeah. But – let me remind you, the transfer portal is one railroad and the name, image, and likeness situation is another railroad. The transfer portal is, um, <laughs> I mean, the transfer portal has caused all sorts of issues in college athletics, not just with football. The portal combined with the NCAA handing out what I like to call these coupons of eligibility. For <laughs> the it's a nice or, way of saying it. With us. Yeah. Or somebody, I mean, because essentially what they've done is they've allowed some kids to play seven years. Yeah. I mean, John Patrician, who was a linebacker at Pittsburgh last year, played seven years of college football. That's absurd. NC State, NC State's going to have a player this year play seven years. I mean, it's just what we've done is we've, we've kind of broken the model. And the bigger question is not name, image, and likeness and not the transfer portal. It's the governance and the organization and the, the membership that is going to play major college football in the next five years and what that looks like. But yep. – Look, we, we've gotten we've gotten in a road and in a place that we never thought we'd get to, and we have no leadership at the top from an NCAA perspective to govern. What we do have, though, I think, is five really, really skilled uh, conference commissioners and Notre Dame's Jack Swarbrick, who's their athletic director. And to be honest with you guys, I think those six people are going to determine the future of college football. It's not going to be some guy in Indianapolis who's 
in my opinion, than stealing money for about the last 12 years. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> about, like a, about like a lobbyist in a way. I mean, and, and that's the, the, really what it comes down to is unless something gets put on it uh, from a governance standpoint, be it the conference or somehow, there will never be any continuity with college football. It's deteriorated the value of a free education uh, from, from a scholarship standpoint. It's become more of a free agency. They're going to have to put some type of boundaries. Nobody likes to play a game with no rules. You don't like to hop in the backyard and say, hey man, it's, it's us three versus you three and don't stake out a touchdown or stake out, alright, you get three downs and you're out. Nobody likes playing like that. You got got to have some type of rules to know where you're going to govern or it's going to get unruly and like you said until somebody puts their foot down and they come up with a nice firm foundation and governance upon this you're going to have some uh, some mutiny on the ship or ships <laughs> there's going to be some upset people well i would i would tell you that it's probably already unruly oh yeah because when a wide receiver at boston college who's not even in the portal is contacted by an intermediary from a third school or a third party yeah. and offers him $600,000 if he will go in the transfer portal. <laughs> uh, I mean, I mean used to couldn't receive a text message from people. West. It ain't been that long ago since I was recruited, and I remember how strict it was. Oh, you know, that, that coach is texting you after hours or something like oh, that. Guys. I mean, I remember hey. being around those. I mean, you remember those days? Hey. Goodness, now oh. it's just like, hey, man, let me call this guy and see if I can get him over here for 500 What, what do you got, 550 All right, let's see if we can get him. I mean. I'm just telling you, in, in nine years ago, I couldn't take a basketball player three blocks in the pouring rain from the Edge Center to Alexander Coliseum for practice. Nope. <laughs> Absolutely not. If you did that, there would have been some type of rule. If you bought him as much as a Big Mac, you could be in trouble. I mean, it's yeah. unbelievable. We That's played. changed. And look, and I'm not saying kids aren't entitled to profit from their name, image, and likeness. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is, is that the NCAA – didn't acknowledge the threat and they created this problem. This problem could have been avoided had the NCAA engaged the membership using their terminology, not mine. If they would have engaged the membership and created some sort of rule book on this, uh, we'd be a lot better off, but that unfortunately did not happen. So now the schools, the major college conferences, schools and, and Notre Dame are kind of left to settle this. And that's going to be the tricky part because the States all put individual name, image and likeness rules in. Those rules are not congruent. They're written in the same general box, but there are differences, and that's going to create some situations that have to be addressed as we go down that road. Yeah, and that'll be very uh, bureaucratic, I'm sure, and a lot of stuff involved with that. So uh, it's that is that is definitely a mess. Well, uh, Wes, how do you think uh, this year, how do you think the Falcons, kind of flipping the page, uh, just to touch briefly on that, how do you think the Falcons did in the draft this year, uh, in particular with Desmond Ritter, they drafted a quarterback. Everybody was kind of looking to see if they were going to draft one. How do you think they rounded up with their uh, with their picks this year? Well, I thought they, I mean, the Drake London pick probably surprised a lot of people, but if you step back and look at it, it kind of fits what they think the future might be. Um, obviously, there's a trem tremendous unknown about Calvin Ridley and, and how that ends up. So Atlanta had to do something to address the situation at wide receiver. Um, so London in the first round was probably a surprise. I think had one of the tackles been available, they would have selected that person. Uh, be it Iguanu, who went to Charlotte uh, at six, or uh, Neil, the youngster from Alabama. I know they like those two in particular. Um, so when they took London at eight, I think a lot of people then thought, well, wait a second, we still need pass rushing. We still need blockers. We need linebackers. You know, we need a lot of things, right? And then I thought they had a terrific day two. I thought their day two was sensational. Ibakite is uh, a young guy I know they're really excited about. Um and then I thought the linebacker, uh, Anderson, is going to be a really good player, the kid from Montana State. And then the uh, – and Desmond Ritter, to me, is a guy you can grow at the quarterback position. He's a playmaker. I know they, they, they liked him a lot. And uh, the one thing I keep seeing in Atlanta is they're drafting with a purpose. They're drafting to build. Um, you know, Schaefer, the kid from Georgia, I, and Fitzpatrick, I think those are guys they feel like you know, can either be on the 53 or be strong practice squad contributors, and that's a good thing. I, I'm kind of excited to just see how it all comes together. I didn't go to the rookie mini camp. I'm going to go to some OTAs and the veteran mini camp when they come together because I want to kind of see this whole thing on the field and, 
and get a feel for what it looks like. But uh, I'm kind of excited. I'm honest with myself. I know it's a long, steep hill, and the schedule is really hard, especially playing, you know, back-to-back games on the West Coast early after you open the season with New Orleans. I would have preferred to open with somebody else beside New Orleans, but that's the way it falls. And, uh, you know, Arthur Smith and Terry Fontenot have been trying to be really honest with people on the way through this process, and I I really respect that. I think they've tried to be – as candid as possible in talking about where the football team is and where the football team has to go. And, uh, you know, Wes, I mean, I've, we've followed the Falcons. Um, I, I mean, I always follow the Falcons and, um, you know, watching it really staying in tune with it, especially since the Super Bowl season, after mm-hmm. you kind of hit or miss with some of those same pieces and you see some stuff kind of deteriorate contracts in, you make you trade Julio Jones away. You, you do this, you do that. You see some guys kind of fizzle out. Um, isn't it kind of refreshing in a way to see, um, you know, pull an NBA team out to kind of as an example, but the Golden State Warriors, they were irrelevant for five to six years. But don't you kind of get the same sense that the Falcons are like, you know what, guys, we kind of just need to retool and let's just keep our heads down, get the pieces we need, good quality talent for a good price, not – huge big ticket items that are going to break you but really building a well-rounded squad because there's so many good athletes coming out of these schools now and if they do it right four or five years from now they will be dominant um in their division uh and really in the league isn't it kind of refreshing to see an nfl team say look guys we're just going back up and we're going to retool this thing because what we've been doing we've tried to squeeze this lemon we got to get a new lemon I think so. I think that everybody has their own dice, though. That's the thing. You've kind of got to run your own race in this. Um, And in Atlanta's case, I mean, the reality of it was that when they finished the 20 campaign, it was going to be awfully hard in 21 and 22 to compete with the salary cap where it was. Yeah. And I honestly thought that the Matt Ryan situation would either happen at the end of this year or before last year. And so when, when all this went down, you know, a month or so ago, I was probably more surprised than anybody else because I, the timing on it didn't kind of fit where I was. But that doesn't mean that it's not the right time. And, you know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a remarkable career he had in Atlanta, and he's a beloved Falcon. But at the same time, nobody more than him recognizes kind of what the business of this is. So, you know, we'll see. But I, I think this is a team that's going to go through some lumps. Um, it's a hard schedule and they're going to, they're going to have to battle a little bit. And the, the real thing is they need to keep their young guys healthy. And I'll be, I jokingly said this the other night to a friend of mine. I honestly believe their three preseason games are going to be very revealing about kind of where they want to go because they're going to have to play these young kids. I mean, yeah. a kid like Tyler Algier is really going to have to play a lot of football in the preseason. And the other thing that kind of got Atlanta in the schedule is the bye week is not until daggone Santa Claus. I mean, <laughs> That's a long year, week. man. Woo. Oh, man, it's a long year for the radio guy. <laughs> I'm about to say. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's going to be really interesting to kind of see how all this works out. But I like Arthur Smith. I like Terry Fontenot a ton. I think they've got good staffs, and it's going to be uh, it's going to be always entertaining. And Arch and I are fortunate to be there. We, we, have, we really enjoy our, our opportunity to be around the team. I tell you why, Wes. Well, that is uh, exactly exactly what we wanted to hear as people that follow the Falcons. Hopefully, we can turn the page and get some good things going there in the ATL. But uh, I know you you kind of like Twitter, right? You're a Twitter guy, right, Wes? Occasionally, yeah. <laughs> occasionally, yeah. Well, here's my uh, here's my kicker question at the end of the the interview with you here. Uh, you probably saw Drew Brees. Mitch, speaking of the Saints, a minute ago, do you think Drew Brees comes back and decides to play football in Seattle? Um, no, I think Drew Brees <laughs> plays tele. I think Drew Brees plays television for somebody. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think Drew Brees is, I don't think he's going to play football again. I don't think his body wants him to play football again, but I, I think, you know, this, this business that I'm in is a little nuts at times <laughs> and people make decisions based on small windows of work. I actually thought Drew Brees had a chance to be pretty good at television. And yep. it just so happened he wasn't particularly good the game they gave him. And that happens. But, um, you know, I think he's I think he's got an opportunity to be pretty revealing in TV. But he needs some reps. These, you know, Tony Romo spoiled it for everybody, guys. I know. <laughs> he, he just you hopped in and did a good job. In, 
started calling plays and before they were happening and all of a sudden everybody thought Harry Houdini was working with Jim Nance. So, um, and then the guy know. gets on a golf course and looks like Tiger Woods. It's like well, Tony, come on, that, man. Give us a that break. Ability too. So I, I think Drew, to be honest, I, I've gotten to meet him a couple different times. I like him. Uh, I think he's a good guy. And uh and I, I don't think that football is in his window, but don't get me wrong either. I thought Tom Brady was retired too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, he'll eventually decide to uh, to put it down. And I got a uh, I got a, a a question here for you, Wes. I just thought about it, thinking about you talking about the West Coast run. How many miles do you think you rack up through the air in the course of the fall? <laughs> Come on, now you got to be don't, don't you? Uh, how many air, airline miles? Uh, what do you think you track between hopping around with the Falcons and the ACC network and all? Can you put a number on it? It's not as much as you think. Um, everybody thinks because, well, it'll be a little different this year because I'll have to go to the West Coast twice in back-to-back weeks. Um, so in that particular case, most of my mileage may be flown in the month of September, uh, depending on where the college game is. Um, I, I'd probably say, and, and people are going to laugh at this. It's, you know, it's less than probably 25,000. I huh. mean, I mean, football, basketball, because when I get on a plane to go do a basketball game in the ACC footprint, I'm usually to the particular city in less than an hour and a half, two hours max. If I go to Boston from Atlanta, that's the longest flight I'll take. Um, but everybody else is roughly 70 to 90 minutes and, so the mileage doesn't really build up, but in the NFL, it builds up pretty quick. And when you do LA Seattle and the team will probably, I'm guessing, I don't know this for sure. I think the team will probably stay out there, but um, I'll fly out, do the game, come back and then go out the next week and come back. That'll, that'll be a, a good <laughs> chunk of my mileage annually. Well, th- that, that answers, that leads me to my next question. <laughs> Are you a coffee guy? I mean, what keeps you going? I mean, to oh. jet lag central there, go hop in. <laughs> It was it coffee? Was she, what is your you advice? Re- how do you recalibrate your advice? Well, the first thing is I don't drink soda anymore. I haven't had a soda in 13 years. <laughs> um, but I drink coffee in the morning, and then it's usually iced tea. Is probably the only other caffeine I'll have. Uh, although they created this caffeinated water now with like 60 milligrams of caffeine, the energy water or whatever they call it. Some of that stuff's not too bad, but I um. I got away from sodas and then I'll have a, a Starbucks in the morning and that's about it. And I'm actually trying to cut down, but I'm not doing a very good job at it right now. So it's hard, but it's, it's um, hard. That's the way, that's the way you get through the travel and you got to try and sleep. I, I do try and sleep at least some reasonable amount of time every night. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Wes Durham, we certainly do appreciate you joining us here on the Rob, Ben, and Joe Show. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, my friend. Right. Okay, guys. Be well. Thank you, Wes. Good, Wes. Thank you, man. Take care. Hey, thanks for listening to the Rob, Ben, and Joe podcast brought to you by the Houston Clinic and Oconee EMC. If you'd like to hear more, check us out on Spotify or wherever you download your favorite podcast. Find more online at rbjshow.com. Thanks for listening, and tell your friends about the Rob, Ben, and Joe Show.